Okay, welcome. Today we're going to have a discussion about chemical bonding. We're going to begin chapter 6 today. We're going to move these structures out of the way and we'll probably bring them back quite a bit during this chapter. We'll tell you what they mean. So, for chemical bonding, you need to remember that there are two broad classes of chemical bonds. Now, those that bond atoms or ions together within a molecule or solid structure are called in intramolecular bonds. Uh, those that bond molecules to other molecules are called intermolecular bonds. Now let me just talk a little bit about the difference between the two. By the way, we're going to spend most of our time talking about the intramolecular bond. So let me introduce that first. Um, if I use this model to represent the water molecule, a hydrogen with two, uh, excuse me, two hydrogens with an oxygen. Um, the bond that holds the hydrogen atoms to the oxygen atom is an intramolecular bond. If this model represented methane, a carbon bonded to four hydrogen atoms, this bond right here would represent an intramolecular bond. It's bonds that hold the atoms together within a molecule or ions together with in an ionic lattice. Now, the other flavor is an intermolecular bond. So water molecules are actually attracted to other water molecules. Um, we will learn that water is a polar molecule. It has a positive end and a negative end. And so if you have two water molecules uh, thrown together in a box, they are going to be attracted to each other like two magnets would. And the force of attraction uh, between two separate molecules is called the intermolecular bond. So when this hydrogen from this water molecule is attracted to this oxygen in a totally separate molecule, we call that an intermolecular bond. Now, we're going to spend most of our time in this unit talking about these guys right here. The bonds that hold atoms together within a molecule or ions together within an ionic lattice. And those are the intramolecular bonds. Now, the chemical bonds formed between atoms depends upon two periodic properties. Their electron configuration and the attraction that the atoms have for electrons. The relative tendency of an atom to attract electrons to itself when bonded to another atom is called electronegativity. Oh, that's supposed to be a Y right there, sorry. Now the, the table number and page number are wrong that I have in your notes, so please change that. It's figure 20 on page 161 of your textbook. It shows variation and electronegativities follows the same trend as ionization energies. In other words, as you move to the right, electronegativity increases. And when you move up a group, electronegativity also increases. Now, of course, this is related in large part to the radius of the atom. As the atom's radius gets smaller, the nucleus is able to attract electrons to itself more easily. So once again, the electronegativity increases when you move to the right, and it increases when you move up a family. Now, um, when two atoms transfer electrons, we know that ions are produced. That's a vocabulary term from a lecture not too long ago. The electrostatic force that holds the two ions together due to their differing charges, one being positive, one being negative, is called the ionic bond. These compounds have the following properties. Oops, oh, I don't have another page for that, so I'm just going to list it right down here. Uh, they have high melting points. They often form crystals, and many are soluble in water. So the ionic compounds have high melting points, they form crystals, and many are soluble in water.
Now, if you take a look at a model of sodium chloride, notice that there are no distinct molecules of sodium chloride. Instead, we see a network of large chloride ions and small sodium ions. This pattern is called a lattice. And it will be discussed later if time permits. Now, this model is not that big, so I, what I did is I got a bigger picture for us to look at here. Hopefully we can see this a bit better. If you take a look at this crystalline structure, this lattice structure of sodium chloride, you'll notice there's not a molecule of sodium chloride. For instance, this chloride ion, do you notice it's larger than the sodium ions? Think about why. Remember, negative ions are larger than the atom from which they came. Positive ions are smaller uh, than the atom from which they came. And um, these guys are in the same period, so there's, there's rationale behind the, the reasoning here that the sodium ion is smaller than the chloride ion, but that's sort of beside the point right now. Notice that there's no distinct molecule of sodium chloride. This chloride ion is attracted to this sodium ion over here on the right, and it's attracted to this sodium ion on the left, the one above, the one below, and if you look carefully, the one behind it. And also, if this crystal structure continued in this direction, so it's coming towards you, wouldn't there be another sodium ion here? So that chloride ion is, in fact, attracted to one, two, three, four, five, and the one you can't see, six sodium ions. So you might wonder, well, why is the formula for sodium chloride NaCl, inferring a one-to-one -one ratio? Shouldn't there be six chlorines for every one sodium? Well, not so fast. Let's take a look at uh, this sodium ion. Uh, maybe that one's too hard to see. Let's take a look at this one right here. Do you notice it's attracted to the chloride to the right, to the chloride to the left, the one below, the one behind it, and wouldn't it be attracted to one on top and one in front of it? So once again, one sodium is attracted to six chlorides. So we see that there are six sodiums for every six chlorides. We get our one-to-one -one ratio. We call this cute little network of ions a crystalline lattice. And we'll actually talk about those more later in the year. Now, it's logical to assume that in the reaction forming sodium chloride, that there's a transfer of electrons from neutral sodium to neutral chloride ions. Remember, sodium has 11 electrons. That's not a stable configuration. I would like to have 10 so I can have a noble gas configuration like neon. So it loses an electron and becomes a positive ion. Chlorine, on the other hand, has 17 electrons. Still, that's not stable. So in order for it to have a noble gas configuration, it could gain an electron. And when it does that, it forms a negative ion. So we have a positive negative attraction. And that is the basis behind the ionic bond. Now just think about this. We just saw a model of what sodium chloride would look like. For every sodium, there's one chloride. If you saw a model for magnesium chloride, for every magnesium, you would see two chlorides. And if you want to take some time to find those structures on the Internet, please go ahead and do that. In an ionic bond, that forms as the result of the transfer of electrons from a metal atom to a non-metal atom during a chemical reaction. Metals tend to lose electrons and become positive ions. Non-metals tend to gain electrons and form negative ions. That positive and negative attraction is the basis for the ionic bond. Alrighty, we're now going to talk a little bit about covalent bonding. In fact, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about covalent bonding. It's pretty easy to understand why sodium ions and chloride ions should be attracted to each other. They have an opposite charge. We all know that opposites attract. This is the electrostatic attraction. It's not so easy to explain what holds atoms of nonmetals together in a covalent bond. In 1960, a guy named Gilbert N. Lewis, one of America's greatest chemists, published a famous paper. That paper was called The Atom and the Molecule. He suggested in this paper that non-ionic molecular compounds arise from the sharing of electrons between atoms. Such a bond is called a covalent bond. Let's consider hydrogen gas. Its formula is H2. There are two hydrogen atoms attracted to each other, forming what we call a covalent bond. 
we will represent the hydrogen atoms by their electron dot pictures. And you remember how to draw electron dot pictures. Each hydrogen has one dot. Now, each atom has an electron in the 1s orbital. This orbital is capable of holding one more electron for a total of two in the 1s orbital. The theory proposed by Lewis is that the two atoms come close enough to each other so the 1s orbitals, one from each atom, overlap and the two electrons, one from each atom again, can now be shared by both nuclei. So we can envision these coming close enough to each other so they share a pair of electrons. Now if you notice this, if I just look at the hydrogen atom to the right, for some of the time, won't it have two electrons around it? And this hydrogen atom to the left, for some of the time, won't it have two valence electrons? Well, two valence electrons is the noble gas configuration for helium, which is a stable configuration. So by sharing a pair of electrons, once again, one, one electron from each atom, we can attain that stable noble gas configuration. This illustration might show it a bit better. Each 1s orbital has two electrons, at least part of the time, which is the noble gas configuration for helium. If the atoms were human, they would probably rather have the two electrons to themselves. In fact, there are cases where hydrogen does gain an electron to form the H negative ion, but that is an exception. Now, the structure we just drew, where we drew two hydrogens sharing a pair of electrons like that, is called the Lewis structure. It's named after Gilbert and Lewis. And we will learn how to draw Lewis structures um, in this chapter. We'll actually be quite good at it. The force that holds this covalent molecule together is the attraction that each nucleus has for the electrons being shared. This simultaneous attraction for shared electrons by two nu nuclei is the rationale for the covalent bond. Now let's do another one. How would you draw the Lewis structure for hydrogen fluoride? Well, we'd start like this. Hydrogen in group 1 has one valence electron. Remember, if you're in group 1, you have one valence electron. Fluorine is in group 17. It's a halogen. It has seven valence electrons. Its configuration ends with 2s2, 2p5. It's a member of group 17. It has seven valence electrons. So what we would see would be three pairs and one all by its lonesome. Now, notice that hydrogen needs one more electron to attain the noble gas configuration of helium, and fluorine needs one more electron to attain the noble gas configuration of neon. What if they shared a pair in the middle? We would end up with something like this. Remember, fluorine had seven, hydrogen had one valence for a total of eight. I still have eight valence electrons. For part of the time, doesn't fluorine have eight valence electrons, a noble gas configuration. And for part of the time, doesn't the hydrogen have a pair of electrons, which is the noble gas configuration for helium. So the hydrogen atom satisfied since it has two electrons, and the fluorine atom has eight valence electrons. Both of these configurations are the same as a noble gas. Notice that fluorine has an octet around it, two, four, six, eight. There is something very stable and seemingly magical about that number eight. So, for the octet rule, atoms react to have eight valence electrons. Now, instead of saying eight, remember we often like to say four pairs. Now we just saw that there are some exceptions to the octet rule. Helium only needs one pair. Hydrogen only needs one pair around it to be considered stable. There are some other exceptions to the octet rule, and we'll take a look at those later. But for right now, the only two you have to worry about will be helium and hydrogen. They are stable with a full outer level. Since they only have one energy level, they would be stable with a pair of electrons. Okay? All right, let's stop there for right now, and we'll continue this discussion um, with the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.